I went to business school, but not even there, they necessarily teach you how you can build a great company. And they don't answer questions like, if you should even be building a company when you are coming out of university, for example, or if you should maybe rather get a nice stable corporate job, or which trades do successful founders actually have, how do they speak to investors, or what are some of the biggest mistakes that especially young founders seem to make. And the list goes on. For all these questions, I have invited a wonderful woman and perfect expert for this topic, Judith Dada. Judith is a general partner at La Familia, a European venture capital fund investing into B2B technology companies. In very easy words, venture capital is a type of financing that investors provide to startup companies in exchange for partial ownership of the company. So Judith has seen so many founders and teams' successes and failures over the past five and a half years, so she's indeed the perfect person to ask all these questions on how we can actually start building successful companies in our 20s. If we actually have a look at some numbers again, we can see that most successful founders are actually quite old and around the age of 42. So the first question I asked myself, if it's then a smart thing to actually start building companies when we're still very young and are just starting out like right after university. And the crazy thing is that Judith has told me that one of the most common dominators that founders have in their portfolio at La Familia is some kind of founding experience quite early in their lives. It could be really small things like they founded this like student magazine that they ended up selling to some random local, you know, what a publisher. I really think at the end of the day, entrepreneurship is a muscle that can be trained. So I always recommend to everyone as early as possible, if, you're, if that's still in school, if that's in university, if you have kind of an inkling and you have this itch of wanting to start your own thing, just do it. Because I think that the cost will never be lower if you're basically still living from the, the money that you get with BAföG or you know some scholarship or your parents, and you just have no responsibilities typically yet for paying any type of mortgage, you know, or taking care of a family. So I would say the earlier, the better. And it's just like train that muscle as much as you can. Okay, so let's say that you could imagine yourself founding your own company, but you also have another great option at hand, like working at a top tier company, consultancy or whatever it is, and you're kind of torn in between these two. I think being torn is part of growing up. I think everyone felt that. So I think like being torn actually in itself is not a bad thing. I personally always think, especially when you're young, you wanna go after unfair upside opportunities that also come with pretty high risk, right? So I would always say if you have option A and option B and option B is a well-established company, you know, and great, whatever, blue chip name. And, you know, it's a, it's a career path that's pretty linear. And, you know, if you stay there for two years and you'll be promoted and so on and so forth. And there's another option A and that's an option that's, you know, could go super well and that could be an amazing outcome or it could horribly fail. And then you will have probably wasted like half a year or whatever of your life. I would always go for the option that has, you know, the potential to go super well for you, but also comes with the risk that things might horribly fail. Because I think if you do that, you know, kind of two to three times, the odds just are like statistics is just on your side that one time it's going to go really well. And that's going to push you to places that, you know, had you potentially followed the much more linear path, you could not have gotten to. But at the end of the day, both, paths can take you to success right and it's just a question of at the end of the day and, and that's another thing i've learned also gut feeling right i don't much believe in you make the pro and con list and then you just listen to your brain and you pick whatever company you know factually is better i think at the end of the day you need to kind of feel i always say i, mean, I always sound like some you know spiritual witch lady but I, I think you need to feel the energy i don't think it's in your head and i don't think it's in your heart i think it's in your gut right you need to feel energy is something that you feel in your gut it's just like this force that's like pulling you forward, making you get up at, in, in the morning, you know, go to work and want to give your best. I think wherever this energy is coming from, is it job A or job B? I think that's the option that, that you should go for. And if you just do that, you know, a couple of times and kind of also stick with it, because of that, I think that's another thing that I think, especially our generation, so my generation being Gen Y, but then also, you know, kind of the generation after is struggling with is we're kind of all used to the war for talent. And so we're used to, being kind of a scarce resource that you know many employers are fighting for and that's 
oftentimes I think made us chicken out of the actual learning experience, right? So you stay with a company for kind of one and a half years and then things kind of don't really go your way and you wanted to get promoted super early, but that didn't happen. And then you get another offer from another company and like the grass looks always greener on the other side. So you switch jobs to that other company. I think you're kind of, you know, almost bereaving yourself of the opportunity of personal growth because personal growth will only come once you've you know, stuck to something for a certain period of time. I'm not saying stay in a job that's not for you just for the sake of it. But I think we've kind of almost lost that muscle, you know, of just like enduring and then growing through that. And so I think if you take those two things together, listening to your gut and like having a good sense of like holding the pain and endurance, I think those two things will lead you to success. And before you get going and start building, Judith has also shared three very important questions with me that you should be asking yourself before you start building your company. The most important one would be, why am I doing this? I think oftentimes we do things not even understanding what drives us into doing them. It could be something that our parents, you know, kind of did to us when we were young and we never felt good enough or it could be that you know we're still trying to live up to some ideal that was coming from some friendship circle whatever it might be that's giving you ambition and drive i think that can be very healthy but i do still think you should be finding the underlying why would you be going through the pain because it is a painful of starting your own company and and having a very clear sense of purpose in that sense i think a second question is more around the kind of what question. So what type of company do you want to build? I oftentimes see founders, for example, reaching out to VCs with business ideas that just simply do not fit the VC model. And that is totally fine. Not every company should raise VC money. And thank God, not every company out there is a VC backed company. There's many more business models, um, small businesses, services, agencies that can be wonderful businesses. But I think just having a very clear idea of what type of company and also what type of model, like do you want to scale really fast and have lots of employees and kind of also, you know, abstract yourself more and more from the day to day of the business into a more managerial position? Or are you someone that really thrives in the kind of close encounter with your customers and really staying close to them and maybe, you know, kind of a smaller business or kind of, you know, a self-made, you know, business is, is more what you're looking for. And so, so really thinking about the what type of company really fits who I am and what I want to do with my life. And then I think the last question would be more around how, right? So I think, how are you going to endure this? Because I think there is a lot of energy that you get from starting a company, but it will also take a lot of your energy. And most likely there will be many phases in your life when it takes more energy than it gives back to you. And so really thinking about how you'll manage your energy, what the types of you know, things are that need to happen for you to really be in this in the long run, because most businesses are not overnight successes. Of course, those are the ones that we read, you know, about in kind of Business Insider or some Instagram feed of like, you know, this 19 year old turned into a millionaire with her business overnight. That's not typically how things go. It can be a very long and, you know, kind of difficult path. And so really thinking about the, you know, how will I get through this and what are kind of the types of successes or feedback loops that I need to want to do this for a long time. Judith has also just mentioned that especially through social media, it's so easy to believe that companies are an overnight success and that it's not such a painful journey and like the easiest thing in the world, which in most cases, it's of course not. So I also asked her, what are the most important traits that successful founders actually have? I definitely think you need to have a huge sense of ambition, like just wanting to have it all and kind of going through the wall you know head first I think that is something that is very important I think another really important trait is having resilience and again like just that sense of endurance and kind of going into the whole thing knowing that it's going to be painful and not believing all the wonderful stories that you read online about like how everything was always a linear curve up and to the right until IPO and you're just going to be very rich and successful and admired overnight because most founder stories do not at all look like that. And then I think a lot of passion as well. Uh, at the end of the day, it is a long journey and I think passion fuels your ambition and it fuels your energy that again will, will fuel your resilience. So it's almost like a triangle, right? If you have those three things, you have the passion, you have the resilience and you have the ambition. I think that's kind of a perpetuum mobile that will take you pretty far no matter kind of what, you know, 
exact business model you'll be working on. Another trait that she mentioned to me that a lot of successful founders have is the ability not to lie to yourself. We as humans are incredibly good at lying to ourselves. You know, we don't want to know all the things that are wrong with us. We don't want to know all the reasons why our product might be shit and the market might not be there right now. And I might have wasted the last eight months of my life. Like we will find all types of excuses and our brain is wired in such a way that it will skew the data points that are in front of us to make us believe that it's not really us, but it's like this other problem. And so I think this is something that's very, very hard, but really not lying to yourself. And that, you know, let, not letting that, not lying to yourself, get in the way of your resilience. So it's not about, you know, waking up in the morning and saying, everything's shit. I need to stop this business to, right now because that's not resilience. Resilience is pushing through. But it's that fine balance of accepting the stuff that's not working and then having enough energy left to figure out new ways of going about then solving it the right way or finding the next problem that's an actually the worthy problem to, to work on. And so this is the thing that's painful, right? Because you're constantly stuck in this limbo of like not giving up, but also not allowing yourself to, you know, to see success where you shouldn't be seeing success. So having a huge ambition, passion, resilience, and being able to not lie to yourself are things that are not necessarily easy, but these are things that we are actually able to control. So I asked myself, what else actually usually makes or breaks the success of a company, which is maybe a lot harder for us to control? Market timing. The reason for my most startups fail is not because they're horrible, horrible, horrible ideas or because the teams are completely you know, incapable of doing anything. It's just because the timing for the market just was not right. Like the market wasn't there, the poll wasn't there, it wasn't quite ready. And there's so many examples, right? But like the first iPod that failed and so on, like myriads of examples that show this, that oftentimes the companies that go really far are kind of in the right place at the right time and have an amazing team and so on and so forth. It's quite difficult to control because either you have the right time and you don't, you can't really create timing. You can influence it somewhat and you can like stretch yourself and stretch your journey to then be able to just capture the market when it's taking off. But most of the time, that's kind of out of your hands. These days, there's also the saying that the new CEO is actually the CTO. So I ask myself, is this actually true? Or what other skills do we actually need in order to become successful founders? I was having lunch with a friend of mine who's Spanish, uh, who works in a big tech company uh, today. And she, she jokingly said that, you know, she's lived in Berlin, I think for seven years now. And she said, the thing that the Germans still, you know, don't really understand and the French have actually understood much better, which is why French entrepreneurs are kind of, you know, racing ahead of German ones is that Germans still can't sell. They just can't sell themselves, like, you know, sales culture and being able to tell a story and, you know, being willing to embrace that. I mean, obviously, you know, kind of the Elon Muskishness of the world is not necessarily something that we hold dearly in Germany. And I, I, I would agree with that, right? I think at the end of the day, building a company means you're going to sell to a lot of people. You're probably going to sell to some type of investor that's going to fund your business. You're going to sell to all the people you want to quit their jobs and join you on your journey. You're going to sell to your customers. You're going to sell to partners that you want to onboard. So like it's a constant sales job. And so I would say that overall, I think what, you know, kind of German founders can do better still as a population is just leaning into that sales muscle. I would say, you know, I think it's an interesting question. Like, is the CTO the new CEO? I, I definitely think technical talent, you know, has a leg up, but I think they've had for a while and we see more and more of the technical founders who don't necessarily feel they need, you know, that CEO or that kind of business graduate because at the end of the day, they know their customers and, and you know, also the ways of distribution have changed. So you don't necessarily need to go knocking on many doors, but people just kind of fall in love with your product, fall in love with the community you're building online. So I think that also just, you know, empowers certain types of founder profiles that maybe you're not the very classic CEO that we've come to think of, you know, the, the last couple of decades. But overall, at the end of the day, I think no matter what your background is, if you're, you know, a social science graduate, I just looked at, you know, a, a wonderful profile. She's not a founder, but she's a, a wonderful executive, Catherine Maher. She was the former CEO of Wikipedia. I think she's studied Arabic and like, you know, some other sociology or like, you know, social science 
you know, studies as a background and then ended up becoming the CEO of Wikipedia and now does a lot of work in the, in the tech world and with data companies and just really exciting. So I think it really doesn't matter what you did as a background. If you have that muscle and you have that spirit and, and energy for entrepreneurship, I think you can succeed no, no matter what. And that type of skill and ambition is never going to be out of vogue. Uh, for being a successful entrepreneur. Okay, so let's imagine that you do actually want to raise funds and that you do plan on speaking to investors. I asked Judith what a typical first conversation would look like and what kind of questions she would ask me. There's always just the introduction, right? So I want to know who you are, why you're doing what you're doing, and then very quickly, and I think this is very La Familia style, we'll try to go off script, right? So I'm not a big fan of having my of, you know, so how big is the market? And like, blah, 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 blah. Of course, you want to find out about the business, you want to find out, you know, where they stand. But I really like just building on something they said before and just getting a real sense of how the people across from you think, you know, what is what is the way that they structure their thoughts around this issue? What is the way that they get to insights? You know, can they come up with a lot of examples that show that they really know what they're talking about? Or are they really staying on some like abstract theoretical layer of how things are supposed to work in their market? And I can't really get a grasp for, okay, I've actually felt I, I learned something about how you're thinking about this right now. So I think, you know, it's really when you go off script a little bit and you just build a conversation when you learn the most about the founder and also oftentimes the business. She also told me about two straightaway no's during a conversation that you should definitely avoid. One is a founder that's just very defensive and we don't get those very often, but it does happen where, you know, you just try to find out more about the market or you have, you're, you're curious, you, you know, ask one follow-up question and you can just feel their guard going up and the defensiveness going up. That's a big no-no. And I think that's when we typically go cold really quickly, A, because we don't sense that they're, could be a good connection that I think needs to be the basis of any type of partnership going forward. But also because we feel like if you're so defensive speaking to a VC who's supposed to ask you questions about your business and supposed to be critical, then, you know, that that, that likely won't be a, a great trait for making sure you find the truth in your market or whatever it is you're building. So I think that's the first thing. And then the, I think, second thing is just a lack of drive. You know, if I just don't get a sense of, you know, you really want this and you would kill for this, you know, like I need to get, and it's not extroversion versus introversion. You know, you can be a quiet founder and still come across as very urgent. You know, there is something urgent in founders who want to build things. You know, it's almost like you know, they're really counting the minutes and any minute they're wasting not working on problem X or not calling customer Y is a wasted minute. And so you need to get a sense of that drive. And if I, I have a complete lack of that, I think that's also then very quickly turning me to a no. Another great insight that she let me in on is that some of the best founders are incredibly humble about admitting what they don't know and admitting, you know, I, that's a great word. I actually, I haven't thought about that yet. You know, let me think about that some more. I can't, I can't give you a great answer to that right now. Like they just admit, that, you know, they don't know or something's not relevant or whatever it is, but they don't try to, you know, kind of blur over it with some, Yes, answer. We already spoke a bit about the fact that the background of a person doesn't really matter when it comes to building a successful company. But when it comes to investments, I thought, is it actually important from which school, like which university you are coming? Do investors actually care about degrees? The short answer is we invest in both founders with, you know, kind of the classic Harvard, Stanford, whatever, you know, pedigree, and also in founders that didn't even go to university. You know, you'll find both examples in our portfolio. What I will say, and what I do think still speaks in the favor of taking, you know, top universities as talent clusters very seriously, because I've experienced it myself, is I very strongly believe in the power and also the peril of networks. And so what tends to happen at these very prestigious universities is it raises the ambition level of people, especially if they're smaller clusters, 
of you know groups that are forming around certain topics such as technology innovation or entrepreneurship you know and they've already jumped over certain hurdles in order to get to that university in order to then succeed at that university you're just more likely to find a group of people that has a very high pre-existing ambition level and so you know kind of they're all it's almost like again the self-fulfilling prophecy where a group of people just reinforce one another and so you're more likely to find that in you know let's say stanford than you would be you know in any random place where no such network exists in the world. And so I think that still speaks in favor of taking these networks very seriously and kind of acknowledging the powerful mechanisms at play there. But I think at the same time, we also have a responsibility to make these networks more accessible, such that it's not your background, it's not, you know, how much money your parents earn or whether your parents went to university that, in, you know, enables you to become part of those networks. It should be your ambition, your passion, your drive, your intelligence, and so on and so forth. And how much does working experience matter? I think work experience can definitely help, but don't forget that starting your own company also is work experience. Probably some of the most valuable work experience that you can have. If you don't want to found a company on your own, you will need a founding team, some co-founders. So what is actually important when it comes to great teams? Complementarity. I know it's a boring one, but you know there should be some complementarity in the team. And then I think the best founders push one another to become better. You know, 99% of the founder uh, of the talking time is one founder and 0.1% is another founder not so ideal but then sometimes you get these dynamics and you're really impressed because it's not so much that they're interrupting one another but they're really building on one another and you can feel that the fact that one founder is present makes the other founder better and and so that's something that i think is very special it's sometimes hard to spot this especially on zoom but when you are part of such a team dynamic you can really tell that you know just by the mere fact that this team exists they'll go further than if they had both gone on this journey by themselves. With social media at the tip of our fingers, it is so easy to just build whatever we're planning on doing in public. And I think more and more people are doing that. So I actually ask myself, is that a good thing? Like, is that something that we should be doing? It really depends on the type of company you're building. One thing I strongly believe in, setting up a newsletter, even if it's just, you know, to your most loyal customers or to your team, whatever, really helps because it forces you in certain intervals to make sense of your thinking. You know, as a founder, there'll be many different thoughts in your head and it's going to be difficult at times to sort through them. And the fact that you have this external audience that you give a fuck about will force you to hold yourself accountable to driving insight, right? So what have I learned this month? What can I communicate that wasn't yet there last month? And again, the next month. So it's just a forcing mechanism for really structuring all the, you know, sometimes chaotic stuff that's going on in, in your brain. And I think that, that is something that I would generally like recommend to all founders. And I think you can start this fairly early. I then think, you know, some founders overindulge on, you know, like LinkedIn posting and, you know, oversharing. And I do sometimes get a sense that, you know, are they really like actually spending any time with their customers or are they only, you know, posting on LinkedIn? And, and so I would then go back to this initial point around, if it really helps your distribution, if it, if it helps you get customers, then I think definitely do it. I think there's also great examples like, you know, Emily Wise, for example, the founder of Glossier, you know, that obviously Glossier was born out of a blog, you know, so it can make your whole business. I mean, that makes total sense, but I think it really depends on what type of business it is you're founding. Especially when we're young and we're starting out, we're probably not having any leadership experience yet. So is there actually a way for us to learn leadership? I don't think you learn leadership. I think leadership is something that you experience by following or you experience by being thrown into the cold water. I think it's one of the two, right? So I think, how do you experience leadership through following? I think the military is typically a really great example where, you know, no one goes into the military expecting that they're a leader. It's very clear from day one, you enter the military and you're a follower. You're, you know, down, very down in the chain of command. And so you learn by following. That's, you observe, you know, what leadership is doing. And so I think that's one way of learning leadership is just being observant and seeing all the great examples and the bad examples of leaders around you over time. And I think the other, you know, not military-like opportunity is you just 
get thrown into leadership because you know your boss quit or because they need someone to run their department and they're super you know stretched thin and they don't have anyone so they let you do it even though you don't have any experience doing it and then you're likely going to make many many mistakes but you'll also learn the things that went well over time and so i think there's no you know super big shortcut to leadership i think you either need to learn it by following or learn it by being thrown into the cold water Judith has also told me that, especially when we're young, we oftentimes suffer from imposter syndrome. Oh my God, I don't know anything yet. I don't have all this work experience. I haven't built 10 successful companies yet. Can I do this? And so that imposter syndrome and this perceived lack of competence may lead you to overvalue and emphasize experience of others. And so you're kind of trying to patch up that kind of weakness you perceive in yourself by you know hiring too senior profiles too early or hiring profiles that bring some type of like you know experience on paper but then don't have the cultural attributes that actually make them a good fit and someone who can perform in your business right and so i think something that i've learned the hard way and i think many founders need to learn the hard way is you need to strike this balance in between of course acknowledging your weaknesses and finding complementary team members around you that can help you grow and again ambition reinforcement circle but at the same time don't make the mistake of not seeing raw talent because raw talent is likely what you have and what brought you on this journey. And it doesn't mean that, you know, your entire team needs to be, you know, super experienced or super whatever, but it's really allowing yourself to be open enough to just spot people who want to do great things without necessarily, you know, falling into the box ticking of like, oh, but they don't have like nine years of this experience and seven years of this experience. So I think just stay true to yourself and believe in your own sense of being able to spot talent and being super rigorous about the culture and values that you have and finding folks who match and vibe with that versus, you know, seeing all your flaws and then patching that up with people that, you know, you kind of in your, as you said, gut feel knew weren't really, if you had to, you know, draw your own planet and make up your rainforest and pick your best team members, they maybe would not have been the ones that it would have been top of your list. And lastly, I of course had to ask her what the current hottest market is. Well, it is February 2023, uh, so the answer can only be AI, I think, right now. Uh, I think it's exciting, you know, what, what is happening in the field. I think it's been building up for quite some time. I think we're now in the midst of a hype that will also bring quite a lot of disappointment, but I think the, the curve overall has been set and it's really very much looking up and to the right. So I think anyone you know looking to um you know apply ai to some business problem or really go more into the research or kind of technical engineering side of things i think this is a glorious glorious moment to be doing that um and to be thinking about you know how we can start a company in this space thank you so much for watching i truly hope that you have found some of these insights useful and that you can apply one or the other tip or question to your own founding journey, especially when you're starting out. A huge thank you also to Judith again for coming on here and sharing so many insights that she has learned through speaking just with so many different founding teams. Thank you again and I hope to see you very soon in one of my next videos.